Okay, a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. Okay, stop. Okay, band is open. Welcome back and thank you for helping us with our annual bird census. And if you forgot what a census is, we're talking about a bird count. We want to know how many different kind of birds are out there. And we want to know is that are, is the bird population increasing, decreasing, staying the same? And the reason we ask that question is birds are the messengers. They tell us how healthy that world is out there that we all live in. Birds need the same air to breathe that we do. They drink, need clean water like we do. They need clean places to live. So if we take the time to watch and listen and count them and look at that data over the years, we can get a sense of how healthy our world is. So that's the main reason. If you wondered why we're doing it, I guess I could throw this other reason in. It's just plain fun to do this. If, you, if you've not gone on a birding walk, um, this is fun. Hello, my name is Alan Chartier, and I'm here at the E.L. Johnson Nature Center where for the past 30 years we have been doing a bird survey and bird banding program for your school and other uh, schools in the Bloomfield Hills area. This research is uh, unique in Michigan in that you have a nature center available to you very close by unlike uh, any other school district in the state. Uh, there are other bird banding programs, uh, one I know of in Rose Lake near Lansing and another one that I know of at the Chippewa Nature Center uh, in Midland, Michigan, but uh, those students have to travel a long ways to get to their nature center and they don't have a way of participating in the research like you do. Um, you have probably received some exercises from your teachers um, that I created for you to study ahead of time, to study the birds uh, that might be uh, seen and banded here at the nature center during this program. Uh, and hopefully you have studied those and we'll uh, work on those uh, at some point uh, later on. Um, I am uh, in my 15th year of doing this program for you guys. Uh, other bird banders before me uh, included Ben Blazier and Ellie Cox. And Ellie Cox is the person who trained me how to ban birds, uh, which is something that requires a license from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, from the federal government, and also from the state DNR. Uh, and so it takes a lot of uh, training to be able to uh, ban birds and uh, I'm happy to uh, be here to show you how uh, scientists uh, do special studies of birds uh, in a variety of different ways. Bird migration occurs during spring and fall. In spring as the birds head north to their nesting grounds and to the south as they head towards their wintering grounds or their non-breeding areas. Spring migration is the main reason that we do this program at the E.L. Johnson Nature Center because the birds are in their full breeding plumage, they're bright and they're colorful, and they're all in full song getting ready for the nesting season. There are some interesting resources available to you online. Uh, one of the most interesting ones uh, is eBird, which a lot of uh, bird watchers are using to enter their bird sightings in. Uh, and you can register and log on and uh, as you become more experienced you might want to enter your daily bird lists that you see. Uh, eBird likes you to keep track of how far you travel uh, or whether you were casually observing and how many what time of the day it was and so forth. So you need to keep track and they also want you to keep track of how many individuals of each species that you see. So uh, unlike the survey uh, that we do at the Nature Center where we just um, uh, document presence or absence um, with an X or a check mark on a list, we need to know how many are present. It makes a difference uh, as to whether we see two Canada geese on the pond or whether we see 50. That gives us a, a better idea of what the populations might be. Over the last decade or more since eBird has been in existence, there have been millions and millions of birds entered into, into their database. And they have developed this really cool uh, website, uh, eBird Status and Trends, where you can explore the status and trends for 610 different species. And what they have managed to do with, with high-powered computing is uh, they have been able to uh, put together 
uh, migration maps of, of all these different species. And of course, not all species migrate, but uh, let me just go in and, and uh, have you look at uh, one of these. The ruby-throated hummingbird happens to be my favorite, uh, favorite bird. And here's an abundance animation map that it shows you. And let's see if we can get it centered here a little bit. And so it's starting in January. You can see down at the bottom here. And this is where the ruby-throated hummingbirds are in January. So the, the dark purple indicates greater abundance, and the orange is medium, and more yellowish is less abundant. And uh, watch this animation. As it goes through the months on the bottom, uh, you can see as the ruby-throated hummingbirds migrate north. And so here we are at May 16th. I've stopped it. So there's hardly any ruby-throated hummingbirds left down in their wintering area. They're all across the eastern North America where they nest. And then through the summer, June, July, August, they don't move very much, but the abundance changes in August significantly. That's because there are more ruby-throated hummingbirds around. They've nested and they have babies out. And then in September, they all migrate back south. So this is a fun thing to watch for your favorite bird uh, to see how the bird records over, uh, over, over time have helped us to put these computer models together to show exact patterns of migration of various birds. So how about uh, another species like, um, how about our state bird, the American Robin? American Robin is a long ways down the list. 600 species is a lot of birds to look through, but we're getting down into the list where the thrushes are. And so here we are at our American Robin. And so if we look at the American Robin map, you can see that in Michigan there are actually a few robins still around in the, in uh, Michigan. They're not a harbinger of spring like many people think, but most of them are in the deep south. And notice that there are some birds in the western U.S. as well. And so here they are migrating north, and they actually occur quite far north in the summer. And here they are moving back south again. Let me move this so you can see the the months. Okay. And so when it starts, it starts in January. So here's January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December. So this is the relative abundance and movements of American robins across the entire continent of North America. These are some amazing tools that are only made possible from the contributions of amateur bird watchers. Uh, people like me and people like maybe you will be eventually if you, if you start to uh, take up bird watching as a hobby. You don't have to be a scientist to contribute to some really amazing scientific uh, uh, processes and projects. Merlin is a program that helps you identify the birds that you see whether you see them in your backyard, at your feeder, or out in the woods, or out in the marsh. And when you go there, you get to this opening page. Um, you can try it once for free. Um, and uh, you can go down to Try Merlin. Um, if you use it more than once, you will have to register with your um, email address. Um, this is sponsored by the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, uh, which is a very reputable organization, and uh, they will keep your, Nate, your email address on file and they will want to update you on uh, issues related to uh, bird conservation issues and so forth. They will probably ask you if you want to become a member of the Lab of Ornithology and you can decline all of those and uh, when you're done using it you can always um, uh, opt out and uh, unsubscribe from it as well. Um, it's also available as an app that you can use on your iPhone or on your Android. And um, so it's very helpful that way. I like using it on the laptop because the images are uh, larger. 
When you go into Merlin, you start the bird identification process. Where did you see the bird? You can put the city, uh, state, or place. We can put uh, Bloomfield Hills. It will not accept uh, the E.L. Johnson Nature Center, I found. It only takes places that you can mail something to, uh, generally a city. So Bloomfield Hills, when did you see the bird? Today is April 29th. So we'll take, we'll, we'll go back and we can say, um, you know, some other day if you want to, April 27th. And then next, what size was the bird? How big was it? And we have sparrow size or smaller, robin sized, crow sized, or goose sized. So let's say we had a bird that was maybe robin sized. Next it takes you to a field or a screen that tells you, asks you what were the main colors. Well the colors I saw on this bird and it says you can select up to three colors. It was mainly blue. It had some white and some black on it. And we go to next. What was the bird doing? Was it eating at a feeder, swimming or wading? Was it on the ground, in trees or bushes, on a fence or wire, soaring or flying? I saw it eating at the feeder. And so it creates a list of possible birds. And then you can scroll through. Was it a blue jay? Which is a blue, white, and black bird. Has a, has a, a prominent crest on its head. White-breasted nuthatch is also blue, white, and gray. The beak is different. It doesn't have a crest on its head. It has a very short tail. European starling is not a very close match. It does have some bluish on it. Uh, tiny, tiny little white dots. It largely looks black unless you see it in the bright sun. So the farther down we get here, the farther from our description it gets. Tufted titmouse uh, is blue-gray. It has a tiny little black, a bit of black on it and white. It also has a crest. Short little beak. So um, if, any, if any of those are your bird, and I'll tell you, uh, I was thinking of a blue jay when I put this in here just now, and so that was my bird, so I can say this is my bird. Uh, if it's not your bird, uh, you can um, adjust your answers uh, and, uh, and see uh, what it takes you and you can go through the process again. But let's select this is my bird. It says congratulations you identified a blue jay and you can look at the full species account which tells you a lot about blue jays. It'll let you listen to an audio clip which if I didn't have it muted, that would help. Identification information with multiple photos, some videos. Compare it with similar species. If you have other J's in different parts of the country, all of these similar J's are in the western United States, so we, we don't have any problem with those here. Color pattern, behavior, habitat, all kinds of interesting things about identifying the blue jay, but there's also things about their behavior and their life history and their maps. Here's a map of where the blue jay is found. The dark purple is where they're found year round and the blue is where they're kind of scarce and they occasionally wander. Migrating birds will have a slightly different map. Life history will tell you all kinds of things about what kinds of food they eat, where they nest, how they forage, what types of uh, habitat they like to use, and so forth. So this is a very nice app for learning how to identify birds. And maybe in the course of this uh, program, we'll show you some birds, and we won't tell you what they are, and you can use this uh, program and enter the information on what you observe. What field marks do you see? What shape is the bird's beak? Uh, what colors does it have on it? And so forth. But again, you have to select from a list 
So you have to be able to figure out what you're seeing. The program can only go so far. And that is how the Merlin app works. And uh, I hope you try it.